Okay, I'm gonna queue us up now, you ready? Mm -hmm. Well, hello everybody and welcome to our deep sky tour for this evening. This is coming to you from the McDonald Observatory Visitor Center. Uh, I am Kevin Mace. I have Saul Rivera as my co-host tonight. He's also going to be operating our telescope. And we wanted to welcome all of you to the program tonight. We're very, very excited to be here. We have a beautiful night and uh, lots of good stuff to show you tonight, lots of good information. And uh, we're going to introduce ourselves at this point. And some of you have seen me from our moon tours uh, that we have done in the past. Uh, I encourage you to, to look at some of those if you have a chance. Uh, tonight, we are going to be uh, observing several objects for you. Uh, deep sky objects, which are some of my favorite things to look at. Uh, I started doing astronomy when I was a teenager, so that was some number of decades ago. And I became interested in astronomy and physics as a kid and pursued physics and astronomy in college. It was just the only thing I ever wanted to do, really. And I started working here at the observatory in 1992. And I'm still here, and I plan to be here for a while. Uh, Saul is a little more, uh, more recent addition to our staff. Saul, how's it going over there in the dome? Yeah, so right now I'm in the dome. So again, my name is Saul. You've probably seen me in some of the other live deep sky tours as another co-host. I also help out with the programs. I haven't been here nearly as long as Kevin. I've only been here for about two and a half years at this point. Right now, the dome is a little chilly. Right now, the weather is nice and clear. It's currently about 50 degrees in here. There's, but there's some really nice clear skies and very little to no wind. So we're going to have some nice views. And speaking of the views, so as Kevin mentioned, we are going to be looking at some deep sky objects and also talking about the upcoming partial lunar eclipse. Now, throughout the program, if you have any questions, just feel free to leave them in the chat. We have some moderators who are, who are in the chat that can answer any of the questions that pop up. And if there's a question that might need more detail or might be more immediate answering because we might be looking at the target, they will pass it along to us and we will answer those questions. And we also will be open to questions at the end of the program. And kind of speaking of the questions, oh yeah, kind of here we have our little program overview. Yeah, so we'll be talking to Lunar Eclipse, the live views and the Q&A. Though we, you may be wondering where exactly we are and Kevin will tell you a bit more about that. Yeah, we're out here in the beautiful uh, part of West Texas known as the Davis Mountains. And there you're seeing a video clip of our two summits. Uh, well, one summit there in that view. You'll see another summit coming into view on the right side of the screen there. Uh, those two big telescope domes house the 82 and 107 inch telescopes, uh, one of which was built in the 1930s, the other of which in the late 1960s. And now on the other dome, on the other uh, summit there, you can see the other dome. That is our largest and newest telescope known as the Hobby Everly Telescope. Now, a lot of folks wonder why we're out here. And basically we need very dark skies, which we get because we are out in the middle of nowhere, uh, not near any big city. So we have beautiful dark skies. Uh, we also have clear skies most of the time, uh, around 250 clear nights per year. Uh, tonight is one of those nights. And less obvious uh, reasons why we're here is high altitude southern location and free land the land here was donated by the two ranching families who owned this land at the time uh, now on the screen there you can see the location of our frank n bash visitor center uh, right behind the visitor center is where saul is located in our 16 inch telescope dome he's going to be showing you the telescope here in just a second uh, i'm located in our former visitor center also known as the wl moody jr information center and i'm actually in the uh, video studio within that building so i'm actually warm and i do apologize <laughs> so that you're out in the cold and and i'm relatively warm in here uh, oh i got the layers i'm good <laughs> oh good why don't you tell us about that telescope equipment over there yeah so the, the telescope we're looking at tonight so you can see it a little bit behind me some light reflecting offward it's a 16 inch telescope uh richie Charitian, I'm pretty sure I'm botching that name. It's made by RC Optical Systems, have a, has a 3,610 millimeter focal length, F9 focal ratio, lots of other cool little facts about it. The camera we're using is a ZW ASI series that's kind of attached to the bottom of the telescope. 
So yeah, it, it's very far away. I can't point it out from here. And we'll be using some software such as SkyX. So basically for that software, I type in where I want the telescope to go, hit go, and it will do the, go there. And SharpCap is what we'll be using for taking images. Another thing I also want to mention is the camera, the one that's looking at me right now. As you might have noticed, Kevin's in full color while I'm in black and white. I did not go back in time. Instead, we're actually using an infrared camera, which is why I look like I'm back in white and why my eyes might look really weird looking directly at it. It's basically pitch black in here. So this is one of the few ways y'all can actually see me. And with that, so speaking a bit of the stuff we're looking at, the deep sky objects. So deep sky objects are celestial objects that are outside of our solar system. There are three main categories, star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies. And we will be looking at at least one of uh, one variation of each of these targets. And being in the middle of nowhere, having a nice big telescope and a really cool camera gets us, lets us get those really nice views. But before we actually get to those things outside the solar system, we're going to talk a bit about the things inside the solar system. All right. Well, thank you for that, Saul. I wanted to briefly let everybody know just a few objects that you can go out and see in the sky tonight. Uh, all of these things will be up after our live stream, so you don't need to run outside right now and take a look. And at this time, let me have just a moment to remove that screen share and bring up a different one that I would like to show you here. There's some really awesome uh, free software known as Stellarium. Basically, it allows you to input your location on the Earth and uh, you can see the sky from your position at any time of the year. And what I have viewing now showing there on the screen is a view to the south. And if you happen to have stepped outside before the show began tonight, you might have noticed a very, very bright object uh, other than the moon over in the southwest. That is the planet Venus. This is Venus right over here. And then, of course, you saw the moon over there right above and to the right of the moon. Tonight, we have the planet Jupiter. And then a little closer, kind of over about a third of the way from Jupiter to Venus, this object right here is the planet Saturn. And if we zoom out just a little bit here, pan a little higher up in the sky, this is looking high in the west tonight. If you can go outside and take a look after the program tonight, you will notice three bright stars. Uh, one down here called Vega in the constellation of Lyra the Harp, Altair in the con constellation of Aquila the Eagle, and Deneb in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. And if you have three stars, it's really fun to make a triangle. And if you do that, you have made the summer triangle, one of our uh, asterisms, collections of stars that are not constellations, but things that we really like to look at at this time of the year. What I want to do for you next is preview something that is coming up later this month. So let me get rid of, again, that screen share, bring up a different screen share. We do have a almost total lunar eclipse coming up on the 19th of this month. Now, this is the morning of the 19th, not the evening of the 19th and into the 20th. This is the early, early morning hours of November the 19th. And what you see there on the screen now is a map showing the whole Earth. And I'm going to start a little video playing here. If you are within that fully shaded blue region, then you will see all of the lunar eclipse coming up on the morning of the 19th. If you're in one of those bands that are outside the darkest blue region, then you will see uh, some of the lunar eclipse, but not all of the lunar eclipse. It might have already risen eclipsed. It might set before the eclipse is done. And then if you're in none of those shaded regions, uh, we do apologize, you do not get to see this lunar eclipse, but there will be one coming up for you shortly. Again, November the 19th, early morning of the 19th, there are some stages in the eclipse that are the very earliest stages you tend not to notice. It, just a really small shading on the moon, but starting around 1.18 in the morning, and I know this is not exactly conveniently timed, 118 in the morning is when you will notice a bite being taken out of the moon. And remember, during a lunar eclipse, it is the Earth that's in between the sun and the moon. The Earth is casting a shadow 
a curved shadow, so proof that the Earth is a sphere, Earth is not flat, casting its shadow onto the moon. And right there, if you look at the lower left-hand portion of the moon, there's just a tiny, tiny sliver that is still lit up. So this is not a total eclipse. Technically, it's a partial eclipse, but it's really close to being a total eclipse. That mid-portion happens at 3.03 a.m., after which time you will notice that that brighter part getting larger and larger as the moon moves out of the Earth's shadow. And the end of the what's called the umbral phase, where the darkest part of the Earth is covering the moon, that ends at 4.47 a.m. in the morning. So again, not conveniently timed, but um, we apologize and we do uh, uh, encourage you to go out and look at it because really any eclipse like this, if you have a clear sky, is definitely worth going out and taking a look. Hey, Saul, are we ready to go on our first target? We are. All right, well, let me get rid of the eclipse view here and I'm gonna bring up a beautiful view of our first object for this evening, which is known as NGC 7789. NGC stands for New General Catalog. It's basically just a long list of objects that were discovered by different astronomers. And we'll talk about the astronomer in a minute who discovered this object. Uh, this is what we call a star cluster. Uh, now, Saul is going to be telling us more information about star clusters and different types in, in a little bit. But this is a collection of young stars loosely bound by their gravitational force. And these are some of the most beautiful objects to look at in small telescopes, and some of them even in binoculars. Some of them are close enough and bright enough to see either with your naked eye or in a pair of binoculars. I wanna show you, um, I'm gonna break out of our, our live view here, and I'm, I'm kind of getting out of order here, so I apologize, but I, I wanna show you where in the sky this object is. It is visible. This one's not quite visible in a pair of binoculars. You would need a small telescope to see this one. Let's go back over and look at Stellarium so I can show you all where to look to find this one. And we're still here looking to the west. So let's pan over and look in the north. Uh, many of you likely are familiar with a constellation right over here called Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia, the queen of Ethiopia. And what I'd like to do for you now is actually show you a stick figure of Cassiopeia. It doesn't look really like a queen to me. It looks a lot more like the letter M or the letter W. And if you want to see a pretty picture of what Cassiopeia is supposed to represent, there we go. I don't really see that in the sky, but if you do, uh, that's really cool. And to go beyond just seeing Cassiopeia, we invite you all to come out to a star party. We'll be happy to give you a whole constellation tour of the evening sky. And Stellarium has a search function. I already have our objects in here for tonight. You can basically just type anything in and it will show you where it is in the sky, in this case, in relation to the W of Cassiopeia. Okay, let's go back to our live view of the star cluster and Saul is gonna tell us more about this beautiful object. Yeah, so here we have the NGC 7789, also nicknamed Caroline's Rose, because it kind of has like a little opening rose formation. And it's about 7,600 light years away from us. For, by, by the way, one light year is about 6 trillion miles. So 6 trillion times 7,600 It's about how far away this is. It's about 15 light years across. It contains about 1,000 stars. Now these clusters, these stars form in groups inside a cloud of gas we call a star forming nebula. Once all the gas is used up, it leaves behind the star cluster. As time goes on, these open clusters, the stars in them will eventually drift away from one another. They might make their own solar system and kind of go on, on about their business. And open clusters are usually very young we might see them at hundreds of millions of years old. The ones in Caroline's Rose are a bit older, about 1.6 billion years in age, which is a long time for us, but not that much for a star. If these stars were kids who were about to go to school, they'd be going to elementary school. They'd probably be like about 10 years old or so for a regular star. 
And now I've kind of talked a bit about like, well, how their agent stuff. Uh, who actually discovered this, Kevin? Uh, yeah, and I apologize. I got a little out of order with our our uh, script there, Saul. Uh, we're we're both kind of new to this, so forgive us. Uh, I'm going to now uh, show you go back to our slide view here because this object is called Caroline's Rose, and it was named after an astronomer, a very famous uh, woman astronomer named Caroline Herschel. Uh, we're going to be talking about both Caroline and William Herschel. Uh, William Herschel started out doing his, his astronomical observations uh, back in the 1700s, and he was not only an astronomer, but a, a musical composer and musician. He built many telescopes. He ground uh, hundreds of, of mirrors, four telescopes. The largest telescope he made was a 48-inch telescope that you see pictured there on the screen, just an enormous telescope, uh, much, much bigger than the telescope we're using tonight to look at the star cluster. Probably William Herschel's most famous discovery was the planet Uranus in 1781, but he also discovered many moons of the other planets. He discovered infrared light. He discovered over 2,000 deep sky objects. So he had quite a career. However, this star cluster was actually discovered by William's sister, Caroline Herschel. Uh, she started out as an assistant to William, but her duties went far beyond that eventually. Uh, she, she has many firsts. She was the first woman to receive a salary as a scientist. She was also the first woman in England to hold a governmental position. She was the first woman to receive the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. And she also discovered several deep sky objects and comets and polished mirrors and built telescopes along with, with her brother, William. So she was quite prolific in, in the, the many things uh, that both of the Herschels, uh, including William's son, John Herschel, who uh, came after him and made many discoveries of his own. And so they were very well known and discovered almost all of the objects that we're showing you tonight. Looks like Saul is getting ready over there to acquire our second target tonight. And so what I would like to do at this point is show you a pretty picture. We call this a pretty picture. It's a color picture, and the, the difference between the pretty pictures we're going to be showing you tonight and the live telescope images, our live telescope images are utilizing a camera which is not sensitive to color. It, it is a grayscale gray camera, hard to get that out. And the reason we're using a grayscale camera is because they are more sensitive to low levels of light. And we do have moonlight tonight. We're trying to get every ounce of performance out of that camera which is why I wanted to show y'all a beautiful, pretty picture, a long exposure image of this object, along with some data uh, that Saul mentioned uh, a while ago. Another thing I wanted to make y'all aware of is that although you cannot see the star cluster with your naked eye, you can see tonight in the east, rising right about this time, a very famous naked eye star cluster known as Messier 45 or the Pleiades also known as the Seven Sisters. And in the comments right now, if you know a different name for the Pleiades Seven Sisters star cluster, type it in. I'm guessing some of you probably know another name for this object. I'll give you a few moments to think about it. I'll give you a hint. It's a car, it's a model of car. Anything yet? I'm not looking at the comments right now, so. I'll go ahead and tell you, it's Subaru. Subaru is the Japanese word for the Pleiades star cluster. So if you own a Subaru, don't go outside right now, but go outside after the program and look at the logo on your car. It is a representation of the Pleiades star cluster. Hey, Saul, how are we doing on our next target? Looks, I see something over there. He might need just a, a few more seconds. Another very famous star cluster that you might not have known was a star cluster is the Big Dipper. Five of the seven stars in the Big Dipper are actually part of a, a very loose, very old star cluster. They were formed together. They're moving through space together. 
And many more stars, including those five stars in the Big Dipper, are part of this group. I see something on the view there, Saul. Is that, does that look like a nebula? It kind of does. So right now I'm actually going to reduce the exposure a little bit because actually if we get less light, we can see more of the structure. But it actually is enough now that we can actually pull up the view of it. All right, let me pull that up for you. Yeah, so right now here we're seeing a planetary nebulae called NGC 6826, or the funner name, the Blinking Planetary. That's now, pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I'm curious, um, why did they call it the Blinking Planetary? Yeah, so the reason it's called a Blinking Planetary, well, first off, a nebulae, a planetary nebulae like these, like this one, is created when a low mass star like our sun dies. As the star dies, it's pushing away some of its gas and gets smaller and smaller until just the core is left, which we call a white dwarf star. That white dwarf star is still able to light up all the surrounding gas, causing it to light up like a giant neon sign. And the reason this is called a blinking planetary is that depending on the way you look at it, if you look directly at it or away, it looks like the planetary itself, that gas, that nebulae, is kind of, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So it's like, it's there, not there, there, not there, as you're looking slightly away, making it look like it's blinking. Also, the reason why it's called a planetary is that when people, when astronomers first discovered these, they thought there were planets in them. They thought they found the birthplace of new planets. We now know that isn't the case anymore. But the name stuck, which is actually a pretty common thing in astronomy. That's really awesome. And I, I was going to mention as well that the Pleiades sort of blink in the same way. If, if you go outside and you, you sort of identify them, you know, where they are, if you look right at them, they do tend to disappear. You look at, uh, at them from uh, to the side a little bit in your peripheral vision, and they show up much better. And people are always pointing out at star parties or always asking us at star parties, they're like, what is that? And we get to talk about this effect and uh, the effect of your peripheral vision being much more sensitive to low levels of light than your central vision is. Well, that's pretty awesome, Saul. And um, I'm going to show these folks a pretty picture of it like we did before, also identify where it is in the sky. So I guess at this point, you can go back to your uh, to, to uh, getting on the next target for us. Saul has a much harder job than I have over here. So you go ahead and, and work on that, Saul. I'm going to bring up a pretty picture of NGC 6826, the blinking planetary. Uh, this one was also discovered by astronomer William Herschel on the 6th of September in the year 1793. Now, a lot of times when we're doing programs for people out here at the observatory, a lot of folks are surprised that as, as many discoveries were being made back in the 18th century as, as were. And, you know, yeah, the telescope by that point had been around for almost 200 years, getting better and better. Technology was, was improving. Different types of telescopes were being built and astronomers were getting more talented at, at identifying and seeing these objects in their uh, mostly small telescopes at that point. This image that you're seeing here uh, is, I believe, a Hubble Space Telescope image. And you can see the white dwarf star in the middle, a brighter region, a more recent emission of gas in the center, and then the overall larger blue structure there is an earlier phase of mass loss from the uh, dying star in the center. So at, at a much earlier time in its history, that star in the middle would have been sun-like. And as the fuel is expended in the core, the star's, uh, the core structure changes, the star becomes a red giant, it puffs out the outer atmosphere, which is what you're seeing here. And what's left over is this beautiful, uh, very hot, very dense white dwarf star. I also wanna show y'all where in the sky this is. It's in one of my very favorite constellations. So again, let me bring up a different screen share for you here. Again, we're going back to Stellarium. Let's see, where are we looking here? We're looking to the north. So we're going to pan over to the west. 
And I'm going to click on a star in Cygnus the Swan here so that the constellation line comes on. And it kind of looks like a swan. Um, here's the picture. It's, it's sort of convincing. The tail star here is called Deneb. In fact, the word Deneb means tail in Arabic. That's the tail of the swan. His body is in kind of the middle region around the center star here. And then he has a long neck. And his head is marked by this beautiful double star. If you have a telescope, look at that star. It's called Alberio or Beta Cygni. It's not a true double, not, not a true binary star where they're orbiting around each other. It's just a, an optical double, but it's one of the most beautiful in the sky. And if you're having trouble seeing the swan, a lot of folks see just a simple stick figure cross that we call the Northern Cross. And if I bring up our search window, Stellarium will show us exactly where within Cygnus the Swan that we see this object just over to one side near one of his wingtips over there. All right, Saul, I see something in our preview down there that sort of looks like another star cluster. Is it ready for me? Let me get rid of this one so we can bring this next one up here. I think I jumped the gun on Saul there a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, yeah, we can actually talk a bit about where we can find this object. All right. I would be happy to. Let me go back over to Stellarium here. Our next object on the list tonight is another star cluster that is known as M56. And we'll talk about what the M and M56 means here in just a minute. But it is in a constellation. Uh, one of the constellations which has the, the brightest star in the summer triangle, this star right here, I think you can see that on the screen, the star is called Vega. Let me zoom in here a little bit so we can see the summer triangle with Altair and Vega and Deneb up here. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the whole sky. And if the name Vega seems familiar to you, if you're old enough, you might remember that back in the 70s, there was a, a car called the Chevy Vega. If you owned a Vega back then, shoot a comment uh, to us because we're curious as to who had Vegas back then. Uh, I wasn't old enough to drive back then to have a Vega, and I heard they weren't very good cars, but a lot of people had them. So let us know if you had a Vega. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the whole sky. And if I click on Vega, it'll show us the stick figure of the constellation. Now, this one for me is a bit of a stretch. It's supposed to be a harp. Now, honestly, before I turn the picture on, before I turn the illustration on, does that remind you of a harp? Not, not me, not so much, but there's the harp shape. And then within that constellation, Stellarium can show us that M56 is over on the southern end of the constellation. So that is Lyra the Harp. You might also be noticing in our Stellarium view here, this faint band of light that goes across the sky. That is the Milky Way. And the program is not smart enough to realize that when the moon is out really, really bright like tonight, that we're not going to see the Milky Way. But in another 10 days or so, when the moon's out of the sky, after it passes full phase, Go outside, look up from your dark sky location. You should be able to see the Milky Way. All right, Mr. Saul, are we? Uh, looks like we have a proper star cluster there. Yep, we finally got into view. Hey, look at that. This is a, a type of star cluster called a globular star cluster. Now, globular is a fancy term for spherical, basically. And so I was going to explain the difference between the two different types of star clusters in, in just a minute. But you can right away notice that this one looks a lot different than the last star cluster we saw. It's a lot further away. The stars are packed together much more closely and is one of about 150, 175 or so globular star clusters in our Milky Way galaxy. And I like this object and, and globular star clusters in general a lot. They're some of my favorite things to look at because nowhere else in the sky can you see that many stars 
in a single field of view. And this object was discovered by an astronomer named Charles Messier. And I'll show you a picture of Charles Messier when we look at the pretty picture of this object. And I'll, I'll explain at that time who he was, very famous astronomer. But he discovered this back in 1779 at the same time that William, William Herschel was doing his work. My, my chair just jumped there. Uh, it is in size 84 light years across. Where remember, as Saul said a while ago, one light year is six trillion miles. So it's 84 of those light years across. It is 33,000 almost light years away from us, contains about 230,000 stars in this one cluster. And so well, can you tell us more kind of in general about star clusters while I fix my chair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with star clusters, so in general, so early you saw the open cluster. Here we have the globular cluster. As I mentioned with the open cluster, they found they form inside a cloud of gas we call a star forming nebula. Basically, in the gas, gravity's pulling the gas to, in the cloud, gas, the gravity's pulling the gas together. Gas gets more and more compact, more mass, more pressure onto the center, the core. And eventually you get to a point where there's so much mass, so much pressure onto the core that basically forces atoms in the core to fuse together into heavier elements in a process we call nuclear fusion, which basically jumpstarts the star. With, as with, you saw with the open cluster, the stars tend, to, after they use up their gas, they tend to drift away from one another. But with a globular cluster, there's so much, so many stars form so close together that they become gravitationally bound. Even after the gas disperses, they're way too close together to move away from one another and basically stick together for the rest of their lives. These globular star clusters usually have a lot more stars than an open cluster by a long shot and are also very, much, much older. Another thing that Cavill's want to mention, as you might have noticed, it seems like the view's coming in and out, like the focus of it. So it seems nice just a night that we have what we call not so great seeing. Kind of, kind of fuzzes out some of the smaller details. And since this, we're taking a long exposure picture, every couple of 30 seconds, each new frame, you see the focus change slightly. So if you're wondering if there's something with your internet connection, no worries. It's, the, it's our sky that's messing with the view. So that's really the only issue we have with tonight is that what we call our seeing conditions are, are not that great. But, you know, that image of M56 there looks pretty awesome to me. And uh, so we're going to go to our, our next target at this time. Uh, but before he does, I wanted to point out that... <clears throat> There's a lot of what look like brighter stars in that picture, and those are most likely foreground stars. And there's a bunch of them because where this object is located is near the visible uh, band of the Milky Way. And what makes the Milky Way look milky is tens of billions of background stars that you don't see with your eye as stars. They just look like a glow. But with our telescope here, it's picking up those bright stars uh, in the Milky Way and and gives it a really nice kind of three-dimensional effect here. So, uh, so we'll, why don't you go ahead and proceed on to your next target. And what I'm going to do here is change my screen share again because when I went back over there, it, it occurred to me I forgot to show you all something. I forgot to show you the pretty picture of the... Um, last object that we looked at. So let me do that. And, or not the pretty picture, but the, the more familiar versions of these. For a few of our objects tonight, like we did for the first star cluster, we showed you the Pleiades, because you can go out and see the Pleiades. That's the same thing as, as the object we looked at in our telescope, but it's something that's more familiar, something you can just go out and see. For the last object we looked at, the blinking planetary nebula, the probably most famous object of that type is known as the Ring Nebula, which is pictured here. Uh, this was imaged by our own Stephen Hummel here at McDonald Observatory, very talented astrophotographer, host of uh, the other deep sky tours that we've been doing over the last year and a half. I also wanted to show everybody the Helix Nebula, NGC 7293. This is an iconic image uh, by itself, but I noticed it was used a lot 
in the reboot of the Cosmos series, the Neil deGrasse Tyson version of the Cosmos series, um, the second season of which uh, wrapped up, I, I guess, about a year ago or so. We, we had to wait a while to watch it. But it, it was used actually in the opening credits of the Cosmos show, the Helix Nebula. So these are both objects of the same type. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to show these to you. Here's the pretty picture of M56, our globular star cluster. Now, Charles Messier was a French astronomer, and his interest in research in astronomy was comets. He was interested in discovering comets and calculating their orbits, and that was just his, his thing in astronomy. But along the way, in looking for these comets, Charles Messier discovered many, many other objects. Star clusters like this one, galaxies, nebulae, all kinds of stuff. And as he came across these objects, he would make a note of them because M56 in a small telescope looks very much like a comet, sort of small and round and fuzzy. When comets are far from the sun, they don't yet have a tail and they look like small fuzzy things, kind of roundish like M56. And Charles Messier knew this was not a comet because it was not moving with respect to the background stars. And so as he would find these objects, he would make a note of them so that the next time he was in that part of the sky looking for a comet, he would know to expect this thing that looked like a comet but was not a comet that he had seen previously. And so what he made really is a list of things that were not comets and he didn't care about these objects really for the most part and he became famous for this list of things that was not his primary interest in astronomy but i wanted to show you a pretty picture uh, both of charles messier and of m56 and now the difference here again in the pretty pictures versus our live telescope images a color camera was used for the pretty picture and it was uh, much longer exposure during a live program like this, we don't have time to do a long exposure and extensive processing on our images. So they're kind of more or less as you would see them through the telescope versus a long exposure like we have in this image here of M56. All right, Saul is, is still getting set up. It looks like on our next target over there, I see it coming faintly into view, but I'm gonna get, give him a little more time to get that ready. Uh, what I want to do for you again out there is to preview in the sky where our next object is located. So let me go back over to Stellarium here. And we are going to look at a constellation which is near to Lyra the Harp, which we still have highlighted there. Let me do a little reset. We're going to pan over high in the east right now. So we're going to go all the way across the sky. Now I see another familiar group of stars that some of you might know. Remember, here's the moon, Jupiter, Saturn over there. If you go out after the show and look over way to the left of the moon, you'll see four stars. They're not really, really bright stars, but they're kind of noticeable. They're in a square pattern that's actually called the Great Square of Pegasus. And our next object is not located in Pegasus, but it's located in this constellation right over here, which is adjacent to Pegasus, known as Andromeda. And in Andromeda, if I ask Solarium to show us where our next object is, it is a galaxy far, far away, and it's located almost across the border into Perseus, which is this group of stars, but technically it's still over here in the constellation of Andromeda. And Andromeda, the, the constellation, is often known for something within it, the Andromeda galaxy. We're going to show you a galaxy next. It is not the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, we're going to show you one that's actually better suited for looking at with our telescope and camera system. So let me get rid of that view. And Saul, are we ready to go on 891? Yep, we are ready. Wow, look at that. That is that's a galaxy that you know that doesn't look like really anything else in the sky or does it everybody think about it for a minute think about the best view of the milky way that you've ever seen 
say, out here at McDonald Observatory, where it stretches across the whole sky. And running down the middle of the Milky Way, you can see this dark river of material, which is not an absence of stars. It's the presence of intervening huge clouds of gas and dust along the disk, along the equator of our Milky Way galaxy. And I'm looking at that image of what we call NGC 891. And it sort of looks like a mini version of the Milky Way. And it looks like that for the same reason. We're seeing this galaxy edge on. We see our own galaxy edge on because we are in it and we're in the disk. Now, this object was also discovered by William Herschel on October the 6th, 1784. Now, I said a while ago, this is a galaxy far, far away. In, in absolute terms, yes, it, it's a long ways away. It's 27 million light years away. That is a long way away. But in terms of galaxies, that's really pretty close. The nearest galaxy to us, the nearest big galaxy to us, Andromeda, is about two and a half million light years. So this galaxy is only about 10 times further away than that. And we see galaxies out to a little over 12 billion, with a B, light years away from the Milky Way galaxy. So in the grand scheme of things, it's actually a very close galaxy. And it's similar to the Milky Way, not only in that it's a spiral galaxy, but also in terms of its size. The diameter all the way across this galaxy is very similar to the Milky Way at about 110,000 light years. If you were over on one side of the galaxy and you placed a phone call to your buddy on the other side of the galaxy, it would take 110,000 years for that signal to get there. And then 110,000 years for you to hear them say, hello. So that gives you an idea <laughs> of the scale of this galaxy. Isn't that cool, Saul? It's really cool. What kind of galaxies are there out there in space? Yeah, so there's actually three main types of galaxies. So the one you're probably most common with, have seen the most, and also the one we live in is a spiral type galaxy. So here we have, we had, we showed you live view of NGC 891, which is a spiral galaxy, but there are some other variations. Which I'm gonna show you in just a second. Sorry, I'm falling down on the job over here. <laughs> I'm still falling down on the job. <laughs> no worries. Oh, so there we have right. the pretty picture version of yeah. NGC 891, our spiral galaxy. But the there are two other types of galaxies that are out there. So they are elliptical galaxies. So here we have a picture of M87, which is an elliptical galaxy, which are usually the end results of galaxies, usually when they're very old, they're no longer really forming stars. They become kind of these like obelish clouds of gas, dust, and stars. And they are usually also the result of galaxies that crashed into each other. Like in about 5 billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy will collide. And after that collision fully realizes, everything is, all the dust settles, pun kind of intended, they will leave behind an elliptical galaxy. The third type of galaxy is what we call an irregular galaxy. So with a regular galaxy, if you grab a piece of paper near you and just draw a quick squiggle, there's probably an irregular galaxy out there that looks like, like that. Irregular galaxies are usually caused when galaxies are colliding into each other. And the image we have, for example, here is a large Magellanic cloud, which is actually a smaller galaxy, a dwarf galaxy, that's orbiting the Milky Way. Wait, you mean there's galaxies orbiting the Milky Way? Yeah, so actually galax larger galaxies do have smaller galaxies actually orbiting them, which we call dwarf galaxies. And even sometimes the larger galaxies might have consumed the smaller galaxies, dwarf galaxies. They get too close and the dwarf galaxy gets consumed by the larger galaxy and a term we call galactic cannibalism, which I think is just a super cool term. It's like one of those weird space terms so that you're like, wait, that's the actual real thing? But yeah, the Milky Way performs galactic cannibalism every now and then and just consumes the smaller galaxies. We should have a special show on Halloween to just talk about interacting galaxies and galactic cannibalism. Oh, that would be really fun. And we missed our chance. It was like a couple of weeks ago. Okay, yeah. well, we'll do that for you next year, maybe, folks. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, yeah, and I do apologize for having a few slides out of place there. I'm going to go back and, and show the pretty view of our uh, of our galaxy for you. Uh, Saul is going to proceed onward with getting our next target for you. And let me see if I can do this correctly this time. Yeah. Or while you're you're looking for the there we go. Oh, never mind. There you go. Yeah, that pretty picture. All right, Saul, if you will uh, head on to our final target tonight. This is the one I'm most curious about how it's going to look through our telescope. Uh, you'll get that for us here in just a few minutes. All right, NGC 891 is, uh, as you can see here, beautiful edge-on galaxy. When you look out into space and you see all these trillions of galaxies out there, you, you see not only different types, but you see like spiral galaxies that are oriented differently a lot of galaxies like elliptical galaxies wouldn't really look dramatically different when seen from any particular vantage point uh, because they're sort of rounder, sort of football shaped galaxies. But spiral galaxies uh, have, have a very characteristic shape, very flat disc, uh, very wide, very flat disc. And a lot of the variation in appearance of them is simply that we're seeing them from different angles. And that's just random. There, there's no unifying force in the universe that would cause all the disks of the galaxies to align with each other. So in this picture, you can see uh, the, the edge on view of the galaxy, the dust and gas lane crossing in front of it. And because it slices almost precisely through the very center of the galaxy, this one's almost precisely edge on. And you can see in the very center there, it kind of gets a little wider, a little, little more broad right in the middle around what we call the galactic bulge. Earlier in the year, during the middle of the summer, when you're out at a dark place looking at the Milky Way galaxy, as you trace it down toward the south, this is if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you trace it down toward the Southern sky, it, it broadens out just like our galactic bulge here in this other galaxy, it gets very broad and there's a lot of detail you can see there in the middle looking toward the center of our of our Milky Way galaxy. So this is a galaxy, but I'm guessing a lot of you already were aware of a different galaxy, very famous. I mentioned it earlier a couple of times, I think. This is the Andromeda galaxy. Again, a photo from Stephen Hummel here at the observatory. This is our nearest neighbor in space. And because it's so close, we can see it in a level of detail that you don't really get to see for many other galaxies. There, there's one other galaxy in what we call our local group of galaxies. We're going to see that next, um, where you can see a level of detail like this. Now, Saul was just talking about the Large Magellanic Cloud and satellite galaxies that orbit other galaxies. If you look in this image, you can see, of course, the big galaxy right here. This galaxy is not quite edge on. It's tipped toward us just enough that we can kind of see into the central region, see some of the lanes of gas and dust here. But this fuzzy thing down here below it is another galaxy, a smaller galaxy that orbits around the big one. Also, this smaller fuzzy object is another of Andromeda's family of satellite galaxies. It actually has dozens just like the Milky Way has dozens of satellite galaxies. And when you add up Andromeda and its galaxies, its little ones, and the Milky Ways and our little ones, and a third galaxy we're about to see, that is what we call the local group of galaxies. And we're all moving through space together, attached, gravitationally bound to each other, moving through the universe together. All right, Saul, I see what looks like something fuzzy. Yes, something and fuzzy and an even bigger, fuzzier thing. What we're seeing there, everybody, is the thing right in the middle is actually something like the Orion Nebula. And many of you are likely familiar with the, with the Orion Nebula that we see during the wintertime down below the, the belt within the sword of the constellation Orion the Hunter. The Orion Nebula is so close that you, at least from a dark place, you can see it naked eye and it's a beautiful sight in a pair of binoculars and even a, a very small telescope can give an awesome view of the Orion Nebula. And what we're seeing here is that sort of thing. It's a big star forming cloud. It's a star forming nebula, but it's in 
another galaxy. It's not in the Milky Way. It's in a local group, neighboring galaxy, that we call M33, or the Whirlpool, that's wrong, the Pinwheel Galaxy. And I'm going to show you a picture of the Pinwheel here in a minute. But this little fuzzy thing that you see in the middle is a star-forming cloud 2.7 million light years away, located in another galaxy. And you can also see some other fuzziness in there. That's part of other star forming clouds and stars within this other neighboring galaxy. Guess who discovered this object, which is called NGC 604? Wait for it, everybody. It is William Herschel. Yeah, he, he discovered a lot of stuff. And he discovered this object in September of 1784. Now, the size of this star-forming cloud, I know it looks little on the screen, but the true size of this cloud is about 1,500 light years across, which is about 40 times the Orion Nebula. If we took this star-forming cloud out of M33 and brought it to the Milky Way, and put it at the same distance as the Orion Nebula, then this star-forming cloud would actually be brighter than the planet Venus. Oh, wow. Which hopefully y'all went out and saw tonight, or you will after we're done here. It is among the largest star-forming region in our local group of galaxies. And I'm really excited, Saul, that it looks that good, because I was a little worried about how this was going to look on our 16-inch. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised as well. It looks, especially getting to see the rest of some of the galaxy, the stars in there. So Sowell's going to tell us more about these star forming clouds because because uh, I understand there's more than one kind of nebula now now that we've seen a different type. Yeah, exactly. So there are two main types of nebulae. So basically, we want to go in very bare bones definition of a nebula. A nebula is a cloud of gas and dust that's being ionized or energized by a star or stars inside it. Some nebulae are created when a star dies. So things like planetary nebulae, so the blinking planetary we saw earlier is a very good example of a nebula that's created when the star dies. Some other examples are supernova remnants. There are also technically nebulae, which are the leftovers of supernovae. So the Crab Nebula is a very good example of one if you ever want to find a picture of it. On the other end of the spectrum, sometimes the, well, actually backtracking, so the thing that's lying up the cloud of gas and something like a planetary nebula is the leftover star. The leftover core of the dead star is lying up the gases, causing it to lie up like a giant neon sign, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. With a star-forming nebulae, such as with NGC 604 or the Orion Nebula, the stars are being born inside that cloud of gas are then lying up the cloud of gas, giving you these really cool formations. Yeah, that's you can even see some structure in that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gavin, do you want to show them the pretty picture so they can see the structure in even more detail? Yeah, and the reason I was a little concerned about how this was going to show up tonight is just because even though it's 1,500 light years across, it's almost 3 million <laughs> light years away. So it's not like it's a gigantic thing out in space. So let me show you here a really, really cool image of, of this object. And I believe this image as well is from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So we were seeing, in fact, let me go back over to the live view right here. If you look at it, you can see that it's got some kind of dark lanes, maybe like arms, sort of sort of like projections from the clouds sticking off there. Now let's go to look at the pretty image. And yeah, you can see not, you know, in the level of detail this image shows, but you can see some of that in our live view tonight. So again, William Herschel, uh, September of 1784. M33 is the host galaxy of this object. And I want to show you here, I think, in fact, if I just go one ahead, yeah. Now we're looking at the whole galaxy of M33. This is the home galaxy of the NGC 604 star forming cloud. 
And I'm curious if you can spot it, everybody. There's a lot of those little pinkish clouds. Now the color can be different from picture to picture depending on what filters were used. But in this case, look for those pink clouds. Those are the things that form the stars. That tells the stars are forming. Now I'm gonna circle NGC 604. There it is. It's the largest star forming region in this huge galaxy that we call M33. I think that's pretty awesome. It's amazing. Well, everybody, we are toward the end of our program, and uh, I was just looking at our our, our feed uh, from our, our staff here who are supplying us questions tonight. And I'm guessing we've not had a lot of uh, questions submitted to us. Most of those questions hopefully were being answered by our moderators tonight. Uh, I do see one question here from Elizabeth France or Franz. Why are spiral galaxies shaped like a spiral disk? Uh, that's a couple of things going on. As, as the galaxy, the gas and dust that was coalescing under gravity was forming the galaxy initially, the atoms of gas were colliding with each other. And, and plus it's got a little bit of rotation to it. And the effect of having these, these atoms of gas collide is it tends to flatten out the distribution from a, from a spherical distribution like a ball into more of a flat disk. And of course the rotation sort certainly helps with that process. And then, so you had this big cloud of gas collapse down to sort of a disk shape. And within that cloud of that galaxy, huge cloud of gas, smaller clouds of gas were condensing under gravity and forming individual star and planetary systems. So we see this kind of flat uh, disk shape paradigm occurring over and over in our solar system, in our galaxy, and uh, not that all galaxies are shaped like that, but it, it is a very common shape that we like to look at. Well, so well, I'm not seeing really any other questions being being supplied from our moder moderators. They, I'm sure, were doing a great job at answering questions during the the program tonight. Yeah, though I actually do see one that might be a fun one to answer. All right, go for it. So from Chas Hewitt, do astronauts see these images in color? So not really. There's only so much light that we can actually, our eyes can actually gather. We would, if we looked at this, also some of the, well, basically getting a bit of head myself tongue tied. So a lot of the images we see like with color from Hubble and such, it's some of the images might be the true color, what it actually sees, and others might be some filters we add on to know more about it. So with Kevin's current view of NGC 604, well, not of NGC 604, but the galaxy actually resides in, there are some parts that are really bright and pink. We really wouldn't see them that bright, that vibrant, that pink. But we would add the filter to see hydrogen so we can find the star-forming regions. Then we add color to that so it'll be more easily found. So long to make the very, very short question to longer, long story short, Astronauts would not be able to see these colors just looking out the windows. Most of the colors we get is a mix of the actual image plus some filters we add on to find some details more easily. Yeah, it's a shame that our eyes are not more sensitive to color when the level of light is low because otherwise the, the nighttime sky would look dramatically different. Uh, yeah, I, I do now note I was looking at the wrong uh, comment feed here. Uh, I did notice a question from uh, Robert Moores. Do spiral galaxies always rotate clockwise? Um, no, they, like kind of I said earlier, the orientation of things out in space is pretty much random. And so we would expect to see exactly half as many uh, rotating clockwise as ro rotating counterclockwise. And, um, you know, there's no up or down in space, so it's kind of hard to define what up or down would be. But yeah, you'd, you'd see roughly half of these rotating one way and another half roti rotating the other way. Yeah. Oh, here's a question from Joe Mama 619 <laughs> <laughs> Are all the stars we see in the sky within the Milky Way? And if so, are there any stars between the Milky Way and other galaxies? So the stars you do see with the naked eye, all the stars you see are within the Milky Way. It's just the closest stars to us. 
We actually can't see further than that. Basically, anything you see in the night sky that's not another galaxy is something that's in our Milky Way. If there are any stars between the Milky Way and other galaxies, there might be a few. So there's something, something known as nomad stars. Sometimes due to a very huge event, the star could be flung out of its system. Might be some explosions. Better yet, one, one variation we saw was a star that was orbiting the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A, got close, closer. They eventually got so close, they just got slingshotted away. And it's probably just wandering, wandering aimlessly through space, just because it got launched by a supermassive black hole. So there probably are some stars between us and other galaxies that just got flung out, but not really that many. Those poor little stars just floating out in, <laughs> in the cold cosmic void. I feel sorry for them. Uh, speaking of cold cosmic void, Saul is still out there in the dome. And I would imagine he's getting pretty chilly out there. And I wanted to thank him a lot for, for doing the uh, telescope operating tonight and co-hosting with me. We've gone just slightly over our time, everybody. And I, I wanted to, th again, thank all of you out there for attending our deep sky tour tonight. We appreciate your being with us. And do keep an eye on our YouTube channel and the live stream page on mcdonaldobservatory.org. That's our website for upcoming programs. And at this time, I want to bid farewell to all of you out there. And so I will see you tomorrow at work. Yeah, see you tomorrow, Kevin. And everyone have a good night. Good night, everybody.